I'm gonna go get uh, my water stones filled so people can file in for me. people that I don't, don't recognize their their handles. Well, get the Hawaiian breeze out of the way. Can you hold this so I can get my key? Hey everybody, we're getting set up here. Hope everybody's doing good. Uh, Cooper says hi. Um, so today I thought I would do another revisit of uh, turning on the Japanese style lathe. Um, last time we did this was, I think, a month ago, probably already, because we're doing this every Sunday. Um, but we didn't know that we're supposed to shut it down before the hour limit, and so we didn't save. Um, we weren't able to catch this, to save the, the recording, and um, we're working on getting those all put up onto YouTube. So that would be cool, but um, are you laughing at my hair again? <laughs> my mom's finally coming uh, out to visit, and so I'm gonna get a haircut. <laughs> so, um, uh, a recap for those who were here last time, you'll get this twice. But so I started turning maybe 10 years ago, and I started using um, a foot powered pole lathe, which is right right here and um, here let me get by you and you know as a spoon carver and selling at market looking for turned bowls um, working kind of with that hand tool ethos uh, this fit really nicely and so I made a few lathes I learned how to turn and um, this spring pole lathe you know you go back and forth uh, pumping back and forth with this drive strap wrapped around a mandrel. Um, and I guess where I'm going with that is about two years ago, I moved over to exploring this Japanese style lathe. And what attracted me to it was the, the tools. I'd seen some videos on YouTube and um, watching these t Japanese turners use hook tools uh, very, very similar to the tools that I was used to using on the pole lathe. You know, working with pivot cuts and their tool rest is very similar, um, although not mounted solidly or semi-solidly like the pole lathe. And so I instantly recognized the, t the cutting techniques with those, with those tools. And after working uh, in kind of a production setting, turning on the pole lathe, turning, you know, 15 to 30 bowls a week, depending, um, you know, I was starting to get uh, some pinch nerves in my right hand side, the, the leg that I'm standing on. And uh, historically, there are some examples of pole lathes with seats and things where you could kind of take the load off a little bit. But I, I experimented and didn't really um, like that. Um, from compared to what I was used to standing and being able to apply the power um, with a full weight. And so I learned about Japanese lathes, watched a lot of turning videos, and finally reached out to one of my teachers, uh, Takehito Nakajima, and got some photos of a lathe from the Ishikawa prefecture. It's called the Yamanaka style lathe. And I proceeded to build it with the help of my friend and machinist and fellow turner, Wes Piley, out in Idaho. And that was maybe three years ago now. Um, so he made a few parts for me. And I built this Yamanaka-style lathe. And 
uh, proceeded to learn to turn on it. I went to Japan and studied with Takahito and um, came back and forged new hooks uh, from what I learned and, and, and kept turning, slowly sort of working away from pole lathe to electric lathe turning. Um, I still use the pole lathe for turning um, uh, handled vessels, like cups, end grain cups with handles. It's one of the, it's the only tool that you can do that with. And so in my line of woodenware, um, still creating uh, handled vessels at, at different limited runs. So we still use the pole lathe here. And it's also a great way to learn how to turn. Um, learning how to use hooks, which can be used on electric lathe, but to learn to do that safely, you need to um, practice on the pole lathe, where if you catch, nothing bad is gonna happen. Or on electric lathe, if you make a bad cut with a hook, uh, it's very dangerous. You could break your hook, the piece you're turning could explode or fly off the chuck. Um, so I don't advocate uh, learning hooks on electric lathes unless you have experience on a pole lathe first. Um, but so we use that in, in the production here. And then I also teach pole lathe turning and I'm writing a book, the first of its kind, on uh, pole lathe use and some of the history. So all of that kind of joins together and, and looking at the history of these machines um, it looks like the trail kind of ends in the near Far East, you know, Tigris, Euphrates, Mesopotamia, um, quite a long time ago, uh, 3000, 4000 BC. And uh, it looks like the lathe technology spread from there, as did a lot of things. <coughs> and as it moved into Europe, the uh, pole lathe evolved from what I think is the original lathe, although we don't know. Um, some of the earliest depictions of the lathe are in Egypt, and they're a strap lathe, um, which the workpiece is between centers, and someone is pulling um, a strap that's wrapped around it as it turns back and forth, and then the turner is cutting. So that lathe moved east and went into Asia and the Japanese electric lathe is a, almost a direct descendant of those early strap lathes. And the European version, uh, we ended up bringing it upright. Um, in the Middle East, near Middle East, Northern Africa, they're still sitting while working. But then when we move into Europe, people start to stand. And I'm not sure why that is exactly. I think it has to do with climate, but, but it's hard to say. Um, so the Asian lathes are descendant of the same lathe that this is, the strap lathe. And so when we go to Japan, their electric lathes are almost, almost the same as the original strap lathe, except there's electric motor driving it. And in Yamanaka, they developed a flat belt pulley system where you have two belts, one's on a figure eight and one is straight loop and you can move the belt on and off to go forward or, or reverse and um, you're not going back and forth but you're turning in reverse sometimes turning uh, forward sometimes depending on what kind of cut you want to make and that's also depending on what kind of wood orientation you're turning a lot of the Asian uh, bowls are end grain so you're, when you're sitting at the lathe, the, where the lathe is in reverse is where you're going to make the sweet cuts. Um, and then working on the inside, I should say. Outside, you're going to work toward you, forward, and make cuts. So the Yamanaka lathe um, is what I learned on. And that's what you see in some of the videos, this box and you'll see these two levers here and those are attached to mechanisms that move the belts on and off the dr main drive pulley and then there's flat belts that go down to a big drum driven by a motor um, 
because of the belting that we can get here in the U.S. and the distance between drum and main pulleys, flat belts rely on a, on a distance and they rely on a sag to grip. And so I was getting a lot of slipping when I was applying um, force for deeper cuts. And so I abandoned the Yamanaka style lathe for a different version, which basically is just a V-belt pulley mounted to a shaft driven by a motor. So I kind of de I connect, deconnect, I, I, I unconnected all the, all the flat belt pulleys and the big drive drum, and now I just run it down to a, a V-belt and a motor. And with our modern, um, modern motors and variable frequency drives, uh, we can change speeds quite quick anyway, and also um, change directions, I should say, and then we can adjust speed as well. Where the, the lathes that were developed from strap lathe in, in Japan, maybe less than 100 years ago, to the electric lathes now, um, they only had motors that could go in one direction. And so they needed that flat belt system so they could turn in reverse or they could turn forward. And that's all based on the original strap lathe's uh, cutting technique. Sitting in front with no uh, tail stock, you could, and being at strap, you have power on either direction. And so the turner was, the, the turner developed to uh, cuts that were in reverse or forward um, sitting at the lathe. So their electric version uh, is directly tied to those cutting techniques. So that's why it is as it is. And this mobile tool rest moves around. A lot of the, a lot of them ran a cup chuck, a metal cup chuck that everything was hammered into. And a lot of that is based on a production style turning where you're turning a lot of the same style product over and over again. Wooden bull turning is a, is a small, but in, in our scale compared in the West, a very large industry in Ishikawa, they're turning, you know, 20,000 plus bulls a year in that turning region. There's 20 full-time turners doing that in their shops. And they have a cooperative that produces the bowl blanks or cup blanks. And they use these giant um, redesigned metalworking lathes, tracer lathes. So the cup chuck makes sense if you're getting a standardized blank. Last year, is there any questions? Are people asking questions? No, not okay. yet. People are filing in around the 30 people. Yeah. Last around. year, uh, I went to a different region and studied with Kawakami-san and he's an older fellow who has been turning for I think maybe 50 years and in that region they're turning a wide range of products and so he admitted he used the Yamanaka style lathe at first but then converted to a home-built lathe similar to what I did so I kind of was inspired by what he was telling me or sharing with me. And um, I abandoned the Yamanaka style lathe because of not having the right belting, uh, having a VFD, which I had on the original, my original Yamanaka lathe anyway. Um, so it's sort of a moot point if you have the VFD. Um, still maybe not as quick as putting a pedal down, just flipping it with your hand, but still. And they used four jock chucks because they're turning a wide range of products. And they're doing all their roughing out of, of cups and bowl blanks, blank blanks on their own. So they'd rough the stuff out, rough turn it, and then dry it in homemade uh, wood-fired kilns. In Yamanaka, they have vacuum kilns for this stuff. So there's different scales. And I thought maybe because what I'm doing here in northern Wisconsin, there's no wood turning industry like, like there is in Japan and I'm preparing my own blanks or my assistants are. So uh, Joey, who's work, working with me for over a year and a half now, he's on a little bit of a leave. Um, you know, he's prepping, learning to turn by prepping this stuff for me.
to my to my specifications. And so then we dry that stuff, and then I, I can turn it. So this is this is was uh, turned this winter, but I do turn dry, and I, I do turn green. That's mainly my specialty is turning green wood, um, but dealing with quantities of material like I have access to, buying, you know, eight hundred dollars of a semi load of giant silver maples like this big round. Um, I need to prep that wood and work through it so that it doesn't rot before I get to it. And so using sawmills to mill it down and then also um, prepping blanks is a way for me to still train people, uh, which is a passion of mine, and also get um, material to turn that hasn't been compromised by uh, bacteria and early stages of rot and decomposition. So I uh, can turn from green to dry anywhere in between. So Liam Culbertson's question is, um, you said the hooks are similar to a pole lathe, but what are the differences? So the So what you, you can see, the tool on the right is a Western style lathe, pole lathe hook. And the one on the left is a Japanese style lathe, a Japanese style hook. And a lot of this has to do with uh, turning end grain in a, in a deep shearing cut, which you'll see uh, when I turn the, turn the cup. Um, they'll both work on, on either lathe, but... Uh, the Japanese hook isn't, is, um, it demands a more, it demands more movement on the tool rest to get the right cut so that the, this, this bent part, uh, doesn't catch. And on a pole lathe, it, it, we're fixed with a pin here, so we're just pivoting our tool rest like so, and so you can't, you can't cut on this part with this hook, you'll catch. But with a, um, a Western hook, you just have to turn your tool down and you can, you can turn, still get your shearing cut and not catch. So that's one of the main differences with the, with the tool rest on the, on the Asian or the Japanese lathe, you know, I can move my tool rest around wherever I want. And so there, uh, the versatility comes in the tool rest and not in the tool. So that's one of the main differences. The pole lathe, you're bound to the pedal and you're also bound to that pivot point on the tool rest just because of the way the poppets are set up. Obviously you could configure a pole lathe with some kind of platform and then use these hooks, but that's like reinventing the wheel. You just use, you just use these rounder hooks. Are you air drying the cup blanks? They're air drying, yeah. This is a, a, a cup chuck. There's a lot of this turning. We, we run jam chucks to do different, different parts. So this, where you see all, all of this stuff here is, is all jam chucks. Um, and so I have this, I'll just get stuck in here. Um, oh, before I wanted to show you guys the, you know, with the, <laughs> with the, um, the VFD, you can, you can switch things quite quickly. I have this program to switch directions in, in one second. And so, and that, the old Yamanaka style, you would just push your pedal down, spring loaded, lift up, push the other one down, and you can move the belt on and off and do the same thing. The Yamanaka style lathe is nice because you can slip your belts and, and, and make certain cuts where this lathe you can't. So you can, you can turn it down a little bit and then speed it back up again. Um, so it's maybe not as versatile, but um, 
it's harder to maintain. You have to have the right belting and all that stuff. Where do you want me to stand? Um, yeah, probably right, right in here. Okay. So, and all of this to say, I've, I've also got a Western lay that I turned, um, I turned a bowl a couple weeks ago, I guess. And, um, I've been using that for turning tangential wood and using this lathe for end grain um, because it really, really um, works well for that. But side grain wood, not so well because the, the bull gouges that we have today, 40, 40 to 60 degree um, edge geometry, really cuts tangential wood very well but you need a tool rest in a specific location. And um, this machine is a little limited with the, the movable tool rest and semi-fixed position uh, as a turner. So I, I can't move around as much. And so gouges don't really work well on, on this machine. So therefore tangential turning isn't, isn't as good. I do have hooks and, and, and they do turn tangentially in Japan and they have hooks designed for it, but they, they don't work as well as, um, as gouges. Two questions. What advantages are there to turning end grain forms with a dried blank? And the second question, besides waiting for your book to come out, are there resources for pole lathe plans that you recommend? I would like to build one. Um, I'll answer the book question first. There are a few plans kicking around. I think Sharif Adams in the UK might have something. Um, I'm, I obviously have plans in my book, but it'll be a while. And I might have plans available before publication, but I'm still, I'm about to talk to my publisher about how that works. Um, that's all I know, really. Uh, there's Well, you could take the class at North House Folk School. <laughs> yeah, depending on where you are, I do a class at North House. Building and your lathe, forging the tools, learning to turn. Right, so Jasmine just told you. <laughs> um, so there's that option, too. It's one of those things where you can kind of figure it out yourself. The main thing is to have that point, the centers at your base of your sternum. That's really the only requirement. Um, when it comes to end grain, the, uh, what was the advantages of end grain? Of uh, turning end grain forms with a dried blank. Uh, there's no advantages of the actual turning itself. And in fact, turning green wood is easier. But I think I, I said the reason why the advantage of turning dry wood is, is that it's dry and stable and you can process your material. That's the real reason. And store it longer. And store it longer, mm -hmm. right. Um, I think it's important to be versatile with the materials because wood doesn't want to stay green. It, it's natural, its natural want is to dry. And so as green woodworker, I really struggled with that. I have a chest freezer full of wood that I keep green. I, you know, I have all kinds of systems designed to keep wood green. At one time I was contemplating building a walk-in freezer in my basement and then I kind of had second thoughts on how crazy that idea is <laughs> when wood is supposed to dry anyway. And so like all the turners in past, uh, even the pole turners in England back in the day, they were turning green wood when they first got the load and they were turning dry wood by the time they got to the end of the pile. This is well documented. Um, so um, just being able to turn wood at any state, I think is, is worth uh, contemplating. If you're doing it in the context that I am, where I'm buying large quantities and turning, turning, you know, turning thousands of objects a year. I think someone, uh, Austin made, wanted to know if you steam the wood to turn it wet. Uh, I think re maybe re re-wetting it is his question. No, it, it's okay. You just turn it dry. Um, and if, if uh, yeah, you just, you turn it either wet, if I do it, you turn it wet or you turn it dry or some, or some stage in between. But I wouldn't try to wet it back up again. 
there's no need. It's just an extra step for not much. I'm turning with high speed steel tools as they stay sharp with dry wood. You know, you do good cuts and you know, the, the payoff is your, you know, green to dry. Is the, way, the, the comparison is getting smaller or tighter and tighter once you get all that stuff in line. That makes sense. All right, first thing I have to do, because this stuff dried, uh, everything warped a little bit. And wood shrinks in three directions. Uh, and end to end, it doesn't shrink much at all. And if we look at the rings here, the rings are going like so. If you can see that. And I don't know if you can see the oval, but um, it, it, it's shrinking tangentially more than radially. So it's all this way. And the thickness of the rings are here, and then the tangential plane is, is this way. So the oval, it's, we measured this is narrower than, than this. Correct. Sometimes I get it confused. Yeah. So you can see it's kind of kind of wobbly here because it's oval and it's not quite catching. videos I do this prep work before I shoot but I wanted to just show you guys the whole the whole thing get some safety glasses and what I'm gonna do is turn this into a round so that I can turn it around and, and cup chuck it jam chuck it It's, it's, it's oval and so it's not going to tighten like it should. And I'm going to go in reverse and across. always cutting uh, by pivoting so that's with a Japanese lathe or, or the, the pole lathe it's the same Just take a little bit more. My tool is a little dull, too. That'll work.
So the Ouch. sharp, the sharpening. Did you hear that? <laughs> Hurt your ears. Yes. The this these are uh, water stones. Um, I buy a, a different water stones, Japanese water stones, and I just cut them down with a masonry cutting disc into a, a kind of a cone shape. Not cone, tape. Is that bother you? It's like chalk on a chalk. Really? Is it that good? Nails on a chalkboard. It took me a while to figure out what this notch was when it, on all the, uh, the videos of Japanese turning. Until I saw someone use it. Someone asked if there's any chance of cracking the blank when you knock it on. Uh, it depends on how hard you're, you're uh, hammering it on and what degree of taper the, the chuck is. But it's pretty thick. Um, so no, not so much. At the end, when I do the bottoming of the finished cup, you can crack because it's finished. And then I, I gently tap it on to do the bottoming. And then you can crack, especially if it... If you get a bad catch and the cup goes flying, <laughs> which does happen because the bottom, the bottom of the bowl is a, or cup is a, you know, a hard spot to cut. What's the grit stone that you just used? It's an 800 carbide. tool has to be tipped down. If I were to turn and put that blade edge parallel, it would grab too much and catch. So it's always on an angle a little bit. Until you know your limits. dangerous because it's hard to avoid um, uh, grabbing with the hook so you gotta be, gotta be careful so there's another tool a type of scraper and that has a burr sometimes I use the stone too. The stone makes a better bird than the diamond. This hook somehow screams more than the other one. This tool is really hard to learn to use because you're going to get pulled if you apply too much force.
but you can see the shaving. There's fine shavings. And this is where, if I was using a Yamanaka lathe, I could I could slip the belt and get that hook to work better. And that scraper works better at a little bit slower speed. Okay, it's roughed out. Now I'll do, I'll do the, the the final shape. A lot of times I develop a design, a product design. We actually have an order for a cup, so... What kind of cup? Not a travel cup, but the shape. Any old cup? No. So, you know, here's a kind of a wine cup is what I call it. And then, so what I do is I set up these, these templates that have, you know, diameters based on... And then I'll, I'll set up different um, marking gauges calipers and things and they have a a little groove cut in them right right here so that I can make a, a mark on the I'll just show you guys I'll set it I'm not gonna make anything in particular but So you can, maybe you can see that little line that I put there. Mm -hmm. And so, nope. oh, there. so you make your mark and then you slide it up. And if, if your other side of your caliper doesn't line up, then, then it's not in the right spot. So it's that one. And then I also set up the height, you know, on the jig. Like I said, I'm not making anything in particular, but if I was, set up your height and you make a mark there and then uh, you'd set up one more for for your your rim diameter at that location so you can turn turn to that diameter and you've got that diameter and the height and the base diameter uh, again the height then you then your your jig your jig will work correctly but if your diameters are off, or the height's off, then all the proportions change. And I think through the years of turning, I've come to believe that you know, even the most subtle variation in proportion will, will, can uh, deviate from the, from the design and make it less appealing or more appealing. And so it, it's a tricky balance. Somebody wanted to know what the grit was of the diamond and that third stone. It must be that. The diamond the is the is a I think it's a six hundred. I could probably use a one fifty or something DMT brand, um, but they don't make burrs very good. Uh, there's something with the grit, and that's not my uh, it's not my conclusion alone. Other others I've talked to talk about that as well. But the stone will ro roll a burr a little bit better. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, and then the green stone is an 800. Well, did you say what grit that was? Mm. That's an 800 as well. Mm. But it's not carbide. The green one's carbide. Mm -hmm. What do we have for time? Uh, we're at 40 minutes. Oops. Mary Tripoli says hi. Mary. Hi, Mary. Eventually I'm going to reconfigure this because I don't have the flat belts and I'm going to get rid of all this bench and I can get my toe rasp past.
Not a travel cup? Uh, like a travel club, cup. Hmm? Like a travel cup. Without the, the lip. So you can see that the beauty of the tool rack, you can really just move it around. Uh, the travel cup shape, I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And so I just wanted to check to see, and it's like, it's really close. And I just did it by eye. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> This is a kind of a large skew inspired by Russian turning end grain, um, the nesting dolls that they make. It's all end grain and they're using skews and hooks there. And so they make these really big um, skews, but I use that to plunge in a little bit. So I'm really combining a lot of different turning uh, techniques in my work. say a lot of my tools are set up for green wood and so this dry wood top is not quite set up for the right angle. It could be a little sharper too but and I got some really wild figure on this. A little texture might be nice. Yeah, I was gonna just show people the other scraper first and then and then I'll put texture on it. But it's such a figured piece, I don't know if I wanna put texture on it because it might detract from the beauty figure. Mm. See that? A lot mm -hmm. of ripple. Um the other other scraper is these uh Usaba, I think they're called. They're handheld scrapers. And again they have uh, a rolled edge too. tell by the shavings that the, the tip of the hook is sharper than the base of the hook. Or the base of the paper. Watching. Hey Rico. Miranda. Yeah, that shape that it's getting a longer shaving. So Tom just Hellman. a few 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 swipes on that to, to to tidy up that burr. You know, and this is what I like about it is 
you know, we think of scraping as it's actually scraping, but it's not true. It's it's actually a cutter if done properly. So these are these are just light light shavings, not dust, but sha actual shavings. Joey. Joey on there? Yeah, he just just popped on, I think. I don't know <laughs> if I want to put texture on this. Okay, fine. Do that. Fine. Put some lacquer on there. It'll make it look nice. That was not what the order was for. Well, I'll make it up. <laughs> I'm going to try to tune that up just a little bit more. How are we doing on time? 46 minutes. We'll probably end up doing two videos again like last time, but the second one probably won't be another hour. Um, I'll get this flipped over and we'll start hollowing and then maybe 15 more minutes after that, just so you guys know. If we run out of time, just tune back in. There, better again. I haven't turned in a, maybe a month, so I don't remember where my tools are at for sharpening. Do you have extraction in your workshop? I think that's air. No, I don't. Uh, I do on the other side, uh, but we don't tend to need it too much because most of the time we're cutting and not making too much dust. But I, I will be getting an air filter. Um, you know, just because, but. In Yamanaka, they just use a fan facing, yeah, the, window. Fan facing the window. There's a little bit of, you can feel something bumping. The grain is different hardnesses from that that figure, but uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. There's a secret weapon. Some of you people are gonna scream, <laughs> scream with the. Uh... I don't like to use sandpaper much at all. With that scraper, you don't have to. If I was sanding a lot, I definitely would have extraction, but um, sometimes I just use it to get a little bit of that in line, and then I'll go back and scrape. Pretty close. I'm going to tune it up again once I get rid of this extra. Here so I can line up. So 
sometimes I need to use it. Yeah, close enough. If it's too far off, you'll get an inner wall and an outer wall that aren't even, and uh, there, there won't be, uh, it just won't look good. If you can string up the pole to go backwards to cut from that orientation. Uh, you, your tailstock will be in the way. Mm. Also, Mary, I thought calling it a bike lathe was pretty cool. Like, maybe you could invent something. <laughs> Bicycle run pole lathe. too much but it's nice to to get it um where's my Oop. uh question about putting these on youtube so what channel are you going to upload these onto they're gonna be on my over the years i've created three youtube channels because i changed my email address and you and google is like tied it's tied to your e your email and so anyway i hadn't figured out the situation and finally if they changed their sort of their rules the ability to change names uh so now my my original youtube channel um i'll be posting all of these so and it's jared doll um, if you search, there's a bunch of pole lathe stuff on there and a bunch of spoon carving stuff. So if you've seen my original, you know, when I first kind of kicked off the spoon mule scene, there's the original spoon mule outside of Sweden probably on that, you know, from six, seven, eight years ago and some spoon carving stuff and a little bit, one pole lathe turning video. Um, I'm working on a birch bark canoe in one. And so I'm going to put all my videos there and I'll announce it once we figure it out. And there's just these videos we're doing on Sundays. They're, you know, they're turning out to be mm -hmm. like three or four gigs a piece. And so we're having some issues with our full memory computer, getting them off of the iCloud onto the computer so we can put them on YouTube. So we're at 54 and a half minutes. Okay. At five, at five, 54, it's there. Well, let's end it now. Okay. So, so we'll, log back in. Yeah, we're going to shut it down. Give us a minute and um, we'll do, we'll do this again and we'll do the hollowing. So, so hopefully. log back in in a couple minutes. Hopefully see you soon. Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll see the noise. Okay. <laughs> 